don't worry about what people are saying is cool. Worry about what you think is cool, what, what you want to use. My best successes have been things where my focus was making what I wanted to have at the table. Like, like making a book that this is what I, this is made so that I can use it. This is how I need, need it to be laid out. This is what's, this is the info I have to have to run this. Hi, welcome to the Daiku Podcast. I'm Gary Snell and with me is Nate Tremme. Nate has been doing design work as Highland Paranormal Society and he's done great work on uh, Tunnel Goons, Cosmic Objects, What Child Is This, Barrow of the Elf King, and Dogtooth Valley, just to name a few. But uh, we're going to talk all about those. But first of all, Nate, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, it's uh, certainly my pleasure. Uh, I've been a big fan of yours ever since I kind of re-entered the hobby not too long ago, I guess. Um, and uh, your work just kind of jumped out at me as like something super creative and super super fun. And I'm really excited that you could join us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. But uh, as always, and we got to do it, how did you get started in role-playing games? Um, so probably unlike a lot of people I didn't play as a kid, I probably, I played the, the first time I played was in college. I uh, played in a, I guess it was like 3.5 Dungeons and Dragons um, with some friends who had played and uh, I was hooked immediately. I didn't, I still don't know how to make a character in that <laughs> system. It's too complicated for me, but uh, I had a lot of fun with it. And then, um, so I, I played that. And then I remember when they started doing the, uh, fifth edition play test and it was called D&D Next. I was into that and playing that a lot. And at some point, I just like uh, was on the internet, you know, looking how like everything you're like, all right, I like this thing, but I'm sure there's like a cool underground thing uh, version of this. And I just started finding people, you know, making zines and stuff online and getting into um, these like little um smaller games like the black hack was a big one um troika and you know those kind of games that were just i don't know doing something more creative than what i was seeing from dungeons and dragons and uh yeah i kind of got into that stuff and also like most things i get into i'm like if i like something i'm like oh maybe i can try to make this and then i started doing that and was hooked on making my own games and i've been doing it ever since well, your style and like how I see your approach to it, I can't help but wonder what was your background before you got into game design? Like, was it print and other graphic design? Yes, uh, mostly print design. I've been working as a graphic designer um, for a long time um, since I went to school for graphic design um, and kind of been working since I started going to school. And that was, so I went to college first in. 2016 so kind of since then i've been you know doing graphic design pretty heavily and that's been my main job since then um so yeah i've been i've been doing like concert posters and album art i did stuff like that a lot before i got into games and i could totally see that i mean a lot of your style it, it strikes me as like good uh, concert posters and <laughs> nice. uh, and that kind of thing and did you think of like, I mean, you know, you see the 5e world and that kind of design as kind of that, uh, I don't even know what it is. It's kind of that uh, airbrushed kind of design and yeah, style yeah. is not quite that. So how did, yeah. did how did you think it would be received? Um, I don't know. I didn't really think about it that much. Um, Cause I, I like, uh, I was getting into like the OSR games and stuff. And a lot of that had a lot of, um, or you know osr post osr whatever that they're calling all the stuff but uh like black hack and stuff had has sort of you know a metal band uh poster vibe to it so i i felt kind of comfortable with with some of the aesthetics that were going on um and there was and then there was other stuff that you know was even you know pretty far out there um I think Troika had, you know, a bunch of like really cool art going on that I wouldn't know exactly how to define. So it felt like it was a, a scene that was comfortable with, you know, pushing the boundaries or being creative. So I, I didn't worry about people not 
accepting it or anything like that. It, it, I felt like there's so much creative stuff going on that I was like, all right, this seems like the place to just do whatever I want. And it was, yeah, it was, it's a, there's a great community of small creators in the RPG scene, just making cool stuff pretty much nonstop. There's too much stuff out there. <laughs> Well, yeah, and every time like I see that you release something, I'm just like, oh, I'm jealous. Like how, like how you're very pro- prolific in your designs, and you're always putting stuff out there, and you have a great Patreon um, that you release stuff through. And w- when did you find a kind of find that first success where you went, hey, I think I'm good at this, or I at least people want my stuff, and maybe I could do a Patreon um, and um, keep going with it. Yeah, I. I started making stuff kind of in the tail end of uh, when Google Plus was kind of the place people were doing sharing a lot of RPG stuff. So I kind of got in at the tail end of that. And it, I was that's kind of where I was seeing all this stuff and getting into it. And then that died. And before that had died, I made a game called In the Light of a Ghost Star. And that started that kind. Of, that was the first thing I made that seemed to get any attention. Like people were playing that and. Uh, making little add-ons for it and stuff and i made like a hundred copies of that like printed on my black and white printer at home and hand stapled made made a bunch of those and um see that was also like when exalted funeral verse first popped up so they were kind of getting started so i i emailed them like hey would ask them would y'all be interested in this and they're like yes so i made like a hundred that's when i made a hundred copies and sent a bunch of them to them and um so that in the light of a ghost star was the first thing that got attention and then google plus died um you know google pulled the plug on it i think they do that with a lot of their products but um everyone was scrambling for a new place on the internet um i landed on twitter with a lot of people and I think I kind of got lucky with um, people were really looking to find or recover some kind of community that was gone when Google Plus went away. And so I was kind of, and I had a bunch of stuff to post at that time and and a lot of very graph, you know, uh, graphically oriented stuff, which does is I think on most social media, but especially on Twitter, people like to look at cool pictures of stuff. So I think I had um, just like a, a good timing of like people were really looking for RPG stuff, like small RPG stuff. And I was just had a bunch of pictures to post and everyone was like looking for some. So I don't know. I, I felt like like any success I've had was mostly luck at the time of just being like, all right, I got stuff while people are looking for it. And um, yeah, people started playing some of my games. And um, I would say I'm by, by no means uh, would I say I'm like, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know what what how to define like success or whatever. But uh, I feel like people play people I don't know play my games, and that feels like a cool thing. So um, definitely, I feel like it was a lot of luck and good timing. And your your personal brand, the Highland Paranormal Society. When how did you come up with that and the aesthetics of that? Uh, was it just a natural yeah. flow out of your background? Yeah. So I was using that name before I got into games. Um, I live in a neighborhood called Highland in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, and there's, I've lived here for, for, for a little while, and there's kind of a pretty strong art community, so I was making a lot of posters and selling those, like I'd go to like, you know, little pop-up art events, and I'd sell posters and stuff that I made, and I was putting Highland Paranormal Society on everything, so whenever I started making games, it was just, you know, like another extension of that. So it was kind of a brand I was already doing, but that it kind of had games took over completely. So, yeah. (laughs) You still get approached for your just normal graphic design and branding? Yes. Yes. Um, I do that. I I, I still sell some posters and T-shirts and stuff that are like local themed things. And um, my day job is I work um, at an organization doing graphic design um, in my neighborhood and and uh, I just last night I did a project for a local nonprofit poster. So yeah, I still do that stuff a lot. That, that's my main gig is still doing graphic design. Yeah. Do you ever get uh, tired of it as far as like you do it in your day job and then, okay, the last thing you want to do when you get home at night is, okay, I got to fire up a, 
a game. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, definitely sometimes. Um, yeah, it definitely I'll get burned out, you know, at, from work, and that it'd be hard to to work on stuff. Like I have all these ideas, and when I get home, I'll like start, and then I'll like start falling asleep. And be like, all right, can't. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, definitely. It sometimes does burn you out doing the same thing for your day job and then your hobby kind of has become a second day job yeah so i, I try to figure out how to balance that <laughs> no don't do uh, not doing a very good job of it to be honest and so i'm assuming uh you're probably proficient in the adobe suite but other what mm -hmm. what do you kind of use to put your work together so uh, yeah adobe i mainly use adobe um i've got the affinity software and i really would like to get into that but I use Adobe at work and it just kind of, it would be, it would be a lot, it would be a hassle to drop it right now. Um, if I didn't need it for, if I didn't use it in a lot of day job stuff I do, I, I would try to switch over just cause it's, it would save a lot of money. Um, but um, yeah, Adobe is my main thing for putting stuff together um, like InDesign I, I lay out everything in InDesign pretty much, but I do most of my artwork. I used to use Photoshop for my artwork with a drawing tablet, but now, but then I got a iPad and I use Procreate for all my illustration now. Yeah, that was a big game changer. Um, I, de I kind of consider myself an illustrator now, which I, even like a couple of years ago, I wouldn't have really considered myself an illustrator. I'm like, I can doodle some stuff that I like and can use, but now I feel, I feel more confident with it. Um, at least I can, I, I feel like enough of an illustrator for my own needs that I can like make what I need. Yeah. And I don't want to get too nerdy because, but I think there's a lot of designers that watch this channel. So hopefully I don't go too deep into it, but with that's, okay, um, that's fine it, with me. We can get into whatever. <laughs> did you try um, uh, using the, uh, the Adobe uh, tablet? Um, which the name escapes me right now their software that they use like uh um, i know you're talking i know you're talking about but i haven't used it okay. no was that yeah and i had so oh go ahead sorry let's say I, I remember procreate i had seen some people using procreate that i was like oh that looks great and as soon as i tried it i was like hooked on it. i was like oh it's so it's just so easy it's so much i don't there it, it has little there's little cheats you can do with it to help you you know like you can like you draw, you just draw a line as wobbly as you want, but you just hold it still and turn straight. Like, so you can always draw a straight line if you need to, like little cheats like that, that I have caught myself. Like when I have like a pencil and paper, I'm like, oh, wait, I don't have the short, like I'll be trying to do these shortcuts and be like, oh, wait, I can't do that. <laughs> Adobe Fresco. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and with, uh, do you do custom brushes or anything like that? Because like, your, your style has that kind of like nice uh, half tone kind of mm -hmm. grungy uh, bits and pieces of it do you do custom brushes or do you um, um... i don't i don't make any brushes but I've, I've spent way too much money buying brushes <laughs> i've got so many brushes um but yeah i got I, yeah i will buy if i see some cool especially some that mimic some kind of print feel like those are like uh, i'm always like oh i probably need that brush even though i usually <laughs> don't yeah I, i'm trying not to buy anymore because it's such a impulse buy thing for me if I see a cool brush, but uh, I've got a lot of brushes on there. Yeah. One of the cool things about Procreate is you can just have any kind of brush you want right there, switch to it immediately. Yeah, yeah. right on. Um, and I wanted to talk to you about some of your pro uh, games that you've created or adventures yeah. and maybe the first one up, which is probably, I would argue, is maybe one of your, your more popular ones um, is Tunnel Goons. Mm -hmm. And I know like that really kind of took off as far as uh, a, a template or like an SRD yeah. or whatever that people could use, yeah. including the, the goon jam. So how did that kind of come to be? Yeah. So tunnel goons. Yeah. Tunnel goons is definitely, I think it's definitely my most popular thing. It's probably got the most downloads. Um, I made that, I don't know, just kind of messing around trying to come up with like an interesting idea for something simple um that i could build off of and that was also about the that was still when it felt like people were really kind of solidifying on twitter after you know trying to find a, a place online and people were starting to move to itch.io to sell games um instead of kind of 
around at that point, I think itch had become my main place to sell games instead of drive through. Um, and I had been involved in some game jam, video game jam stuff before. And like I made tunnel goons. I was just trying to make something that I thought would be a fun little, simple, quick thing to play. And, um, and I liked it. I liked what I came up with and thought it, and I kind of had had it in mind as like, oh, I can have this little simple thing and then I can just add stuff, you know, build onto it if I want to, you know, change up the style of the game anyway. And I kind of had this idea of doing a game jam. Um, which at that point there weren't, I don't want to sound like I'm taking credit for game jams. They've been around forever, but I felt like uh, I wasn't seeing game jams with, in, with uh, tabletop RPGs. And I was like, I feel like people could use this and build off of it. So like I put it out there and I was, I was really nervous. Like when I did that kind of being like, Hey, I, I think, I think I made something so cool. People will want to use it. I was, so I was like, Oh, if nobody uses it, that might be kind of embarrassing, but it got a good response. And a lot of, a lot of people made stuff for it. May, may, people have made stuff that is so much better than <laughs> what Tunnel Goons is. <laughs> That's like, oh, wow. I'll, I don't think I'll ever make a Tunnel Goons thing as cool as uh, the stuff people have made with it. So, yeah, I, I, it was really cool to see people take that and run with it. Yeah. Yeah. And every now and again, I'll see that kind of pop up uh, in other places, like beyond the jam, where somebody's like, yeah, I totally did a Tunnel Goon uh, hack here. And yeah. so, it's really got legs, right? And uh, I think, uh, you know, credit to you for coming up with like a simple design um, concept that like really works. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it was a, yeah, it felt, I, I was just really, it felt like I had just a solid core there. Um, and yeah, I don't even, I'm trying to think, remember, you know, kind of what my initial thoughts were. I just know I wanted to use 2D6 as the main, not have to really use any other dice to do it. And um, and then uh, and another goal was to have it. So when I made adventures for it, for the monster stats, I just had one number. That was like a big goal. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I, did, I didn't want to have a, a, stat, a line of stats or a block of stats at all. I was like, if I can just use one number, like then I'll be, I'll be set. Yeah, and that was, that was probably, the main thing because when i write adventures i hate figuring out the stats for monsters and uh one of my favorite things i've seen with it is um there's this game called riverbend it's like fishing adventures it's like this fishing game made on tunnel games it's so cool uh i got a copy of it somewhere um trying to think i'm trying to remember who made it um uh there's somebody uh Tor the Vic is their their Twitter handle. Um, they I know that they were one of the creators, but somebody else made it with them. It's called Riverbend. Check it out. You can get on Exalted Funeral. It's cool. a, it's, it's one of the coolest things I've seen someone do with tunnel games. Yeah, it made me so happy to see. So it. the bigger fish have the bigger uh, DS and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 cool. It's just, I don't. I think fishing is like a great a great thing. To, it's always cool when you're playing a video game and you're like, Hey, I can go fishing in this game. So I was like, Oh, cool. Someone put fishing into tabletop RPGs. <laughs> and then um, another popular uh, title that you have is what child is this, um, which was, I saw recently featured on uh, adventure tourism. Yeah. They did a bit of a talk about uh, why they liked the adventure so much. And uh, maybe just talk us about the creative process on that one. Yes. I, it probably started as like a joke kind of i uh i was talking to somebody about fifth edition stat blocks you know and complaining about them probably because they're really big and for some reason i was like well i guess i should i should uh write one and i so <laughs> basically it was trying to make a stat block for baby jesus and uh that was that's where it started i was like all right let me make a baby jesus uh for for that would fit into the monster manual and um and then just this idea of, all right, what would you do with this baby? And basically you're babysitting a, a, mess, a messianic baby and uh, in, in this, you know, fantasy world. And it's, it's very simple. It's, it's basically just uh, an account, random encounter table on a hex crawl. You know, when you go to a hex, you roll a new one and see what happens, but you're the adventure is you're stuck with this baby that you're trying to deliver somewhere that has 
uh, some power is very weak. Basically, one hit will kill it. Um, but it has some abilities to kind of protect itself and help the party. And it has so it has this so you have this baby that whenever it will like giggle and do cute little baby stuff, it will everything around it has to make a check or to, to do anything violent. So it kind of like blocks violence from happening. So you could be, you know, monsters are attacking you and then this baby will laugh and suddenly the fight's over and you have to figure out. You have to, I guess you have to role play and figure out what's going on. You know, what do you do now that all these all these monsters suddenly can't fight? They're so enamored with this little baby. So I, I just thought it would be an interesting uh, adventure to try to figure out. Uh, it's one of those things. It's, uh, it's very simple. I don't describe a lot, but I, at the table, I know. I, I imagine it would be very different at different tables. But, um, but yeah, that was the main idea, making you have a little baby Jesus to protect. <laughs> Well, and, you know, that goes to speak to probably a lot of your games where just that whole, the creative spark that it provides people is is probably the, the yeah. core of what uh, people really appreciate about mm -hmm. it. And then I know uh, the next tight title I was going to talk to you about was Barrow of Elf King, which had a very positive review by Bryce on 10 Foot Pole. I think he yeah. said bordering on genius, if I could actually <laughs> use that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did that surprise you to get that kind of uh, welcome from that? Yeah, yeah, was, that that was definitely nice to uh, to have someone like it because I it, I was really happy with it, it and kind of uh, I know when I made it I was I, after I made it I was like oh I felt like this is one of the better better things I made so it was cool that uh, that other people liked it too it was really neat yeah definitely definitely a good feeling when someone. But uh, when someone says like, oh, this is one of the best adventures I've read, that's pretty cool. And especially uh, because, I mean, you tend to have like a bit of a minimal, minimalist kind of approach to it. And you see yeah. some of the other adventures that are like pages and pages and pages. Mm -hmm. Yours was quite, you know, brief in comparison. And that I know that some people were kind of shocked at that. Bryce, uh, who I've interviewed before on mm -hmm. here, um, liked it so much because it was, but as he, one of his key things is terse, evocative uh, language, and you just really yeah. nailed it in that one. Yeah, it, I, I, I'm real happy with how it turned out. And yeah, it was definitely um, the goal. My goal always is try to make things terse and short because I just, I don't have the attention span to to do more so i'm like all right i gotta nail this as quickly as possible because i don't want to spend a lot of time writing this um and uh i my favorite moments in playing games has been a simple setup that at the table you get you know you get to be creative to figure out um if it's like and the worst moments have been when things are so rigid that you don't have room, you don't feel like you have room to play. So it's kind of just given here, it's like, here's some toys. Now there's room for you to play instead of, you know, and instead of here's some instructions to follow or something. I don't know. That, that's kind of my approach, I think. And then speaking of that, we can probably lead into uh, cosmic objects, which uh, it looks like just a space playground to me when I see it. I'm just <laughs> like, wow, that looks fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a kick. I did that for a uh, Kickstarter. And that was really very illustration heavy. That was, I, I was kind of had these ideas to draw these different planets and they eat. So it's about, it's 10 different objects in space that are, most are like planets or asteroid that I drew this, these like illustrative maps for, and then, you know, wrote a description of the locations on them. So it's very, it's very loose. Um, I hope it, sometimes I worry it might be a little too, bare bones like maybe i'm it, sometimes it needs more stuff but it that, that you know that's a that's like a thing of taste it comes down to who's running the game how much they need but it, it was a lot of fun to make it was pretty it was also difficult because that was i started it right before um covid happened so it was a uh, it was kind of delayed for a while trying to you know work on it and then May navigate the world being shut down and you know pl a plague trying not to die and stuff so it was a it, it, it was definitely kind of kind, kind of the most traumatic book I wrote because there's a lot of bad stuff happening at the time um, which is now 
bad stuff that is now normal everyday life. So uh, I guess I guess I've adapted to to just terrible things. But um, but yeah, it was it was a little hard to finish, but I I really enjoyed it, and I got to I got to I don't know focus on on making something I don't know that look really looked the way I want, and it was a lot of fun drawing drawing it was a lot of fun and just kind of coming up with sort of wacky ideas and then making them happen was a lot of fun yeah I, I like how it came out I don't know how many people have played it you know like some things you put out you hear people tell you oh we, I ran this I don't hear a lot of people telling me they ran it so I don't know but but it was a lot of fun to make well I know it's a it's a beautiful looking uh game like you know you. just to even look at it you just kind of i can see a lot of people buying it almost like a coffee table book to just kind of keep out <laughs> which i think a lot of zines kind of end up like yeah. that where it's just yeah. fun to flip through um and with that you were talking about the covid times did you find um because at that time you probably had a lot of titles are already in your library mm -hmm. did you find a spike in your sales yes, definitely it, yeah Yes, that uh, initial shutdown period. Um, I feel like it was I feel like it was a uh, towards the end of the year. For some reason, I remember like in October, after like the pandemic had started, be, seeing like a big spike and being like, "Oh wow, people are really are really looking for games to play." I guess right now. Um, so I guess that's I guess that's one positive that that I sold more games than I had expected to at that time. Um, yeah. And, and not yeah, to pry too much, but did you, were you able to maintain your day job at that time or did you yes. have more time to work on games? Um, I did uh, maintain my day job. Um, there was a few times that I was out that I got to focus more on games. Like I, it's, it's weird to think how different it is now, but at that time, if you thought you had COVID and you were waiting and a test took a long time. So like I, I was, I had been in contact with someone who ended up having COVID. So at my work, I was like, Oh, I told them. So I was like off work for two weeks waiting for my results that were getting delayed. So there was like weird moments like that, which now, now nobody cares. Unfortunately, it's like, it's like, Oh, we'll take, you can take, you can also get a, a quicker test now, but, uh, but, um, but back then, you things were more careful, and you could you could uh, get time off work easier and stuff. So yeah, there was some. I had some downtime to work on stuff then. Um, later in it, um, so I felt like there was a, a productive period in there. But uh, but yeah, it's overall though it was also a kind of hard. It was a lot harder to work on stuff because I think it was just a real stressful time too. Yeah. Um, the next game I want to talk to you about was Prol, which is uh, a coin flipping game where you just yeah. kind of seeing what you could do with such a basic <laughs> concept. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, I drew the character sheet, which is basically the game. Like you can like there's like the the rules are on the character sheet. It's like mark. You have little little picto uh, pictograms that with little bubbles that you can check. To uh, that's basically your character stats. And it's like check those, check four of those or something, and um, you can flip a coin for each check you have. It's very loose, uh, very loose, but uh, I don't know. I felt like it, it. It was. It's one of those things that's just barely enough to be a game, maybe. But uh, but yeah, I was like, what if you just had a coin to flip, no dice to roll? So basically, basically you're using a coin as as a die because you kind of uh, you know you flip it multiple times and to get a success. So the probabilities of it are not that different from dice. Um, but yeah, it was just trying to do something really simple. And then uh, the final game I wanted to talk to you about was uh, Dogtooth Valley, um, which uh, really cool little pocket game. But the thing that I especially appreciated about it was that you put out that video, um, I saw it on YouTube and I think you reposted it on TikTok. Mm -hmm. uh, was how you created Dogtooth Valley. It's yeah, I think a lot of designers, if they're watching us, they should go check that out because I think you did a really good job kind of covering that. Yes, um, that was a very, that was a really smooth uh, adventure to make. It, it's a really small book with a, it's got a hex map in it, and then there's a few dungeons on that map. So it's basically a little hex crawl. The, the idea is I'm going to make a little hex crawl that you can just fit in your pocket and carry around. 
Um, and it's that of the things I've made, that's kind of one of the things that I've actually used the most that I run, have run more than other stuff. Um, it's very written for me. Like I do that. I try to do that most of the time, but that one, especially, I felt like I just kind of was, all right, what do I need when I run an adventure? And it's, so every little thing is, is made for me to be able to easily, you know, use at the table. And, um, and yeah, I tried to document the process of it. And, and uh, yeah, there's, I have a YouTube video where I just go through how I made it, kind of coming up with the initial idea, writing an outline, drawing maps, kind of the whole thing up into the printed product. Um, yeah, and a lot of people, I got a good response on that video. A lot of people uh, liked that. I, lo I love seeing people's process for making things too. And uh, that one just, um, yeah, that was just a fun one. That was a fun video to make because it was a really fun book to make because it was just a very very smooth experience. It was most, I, I spent like a, I spent like a week maybe making that, like from the beginning to the end, like writing and drawing, everything was like about a week and it was done. And, and it's one of my favorite things I've made. So yeah, it was, it's one of those projects that just like the stars aligned and it just no hiccups, just was very smooth. And um, one of the things I noted was I uh, used the uh, Mixam uh, for the printing. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have like kind of local printers or is that kind of like, do you experiment with that or is that a go-to that you use? Mix them is sort of a go-to. They've been the best prices usually that I find. I have printed some stuff uh, locally and every once in a while I'll print with a random online printer that I find some crazy coupon for. Um, but mix them is what I, I print most books with. Um, but sometimes like for ghost star, when I made like the first batch of ghost star, they came with a poster map and like that I printed locally. Um, but most, if I'm printing a book, I'll usually do mix them. Um, there, there are some local printers that I've kind of been, that I use for some things that I might be using in the future, but it usually comes down to what I can afford at the time and mix them is usually the cheapest. Do you find, uh, like, I mean, a lot of your stuff is really lends itself to being kind of mostly digital. Do you find you still love that print side of things or do you ever, oh, yeah. oh, I just want to do digital? Yeah, it, it's real. I really do love having a book, like printed things are really fun. Uh, some, you know, something you can hold that's tactile is definitely, I definitely prefer that. But I also think, I don't, I've done more with digital lately or in the past year that has been really fun. Um, like, um, we were just talking about it, uh, Barrow of the Elf King, that was made all, that was initially made, there, there is a zine you can download and print out, but that was made as like an HTML web page first. And I'm really into that because it's, to be honest, I've kind of found that easier to run. It's easier than a book to use at the table. Um, like that and some other ones I've done, kind of the goal was what can I make that I can just hold my phone and have the whole dungeon on my phone and easily just scroll through and run it, you know, with with nothing else. And uh, I've kind of been on a kick of that for a little bit. I, I made a bunch of little HTML dungeons. Um, I have a goal of eventually making a hex crawl sort of, well, like a website that's a map and there's little spots you can click on that will take you to each dungeon. So you could just like, from a tablet or a phone, just run your whole campaign from there. Kind of, that's kind of, that's something I'm, I'm eventually kind of I'm trying to work towards. But but yeah, kind of using HTML as your main format, or 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 writing in Markdown or something that you could convert to HTML. Just like I don't know, I think that's that's kind of the most accessible thing you can do, and you can it's. Yeah, it's the most accessible because like it's anyone who has access to the internet can get to it. You don't have to worry about printing or shipping anything. And it, in most cases, is more convenient than a book for me, even though a book is a lot of fun to have and flip through. Yeah, I'm kind of, I'm really into making the internet more usable for RPG stuff. And it seems like you really like experimenting uh, with kind of different formats and different things. Does that keep the, your creative spark going? Yes, definitely. A lot of stuff that I've made 
was all all started from the format so a lot of books and things um like i have a postcard dungeon that um my I still have some and usually when someone orders from something from me i throw it in every order because i have a bunch of them still but i was just like that was like i found a coupon to print a bunch of postcards for really cheap so i was like all right let me make something that fits in this small space and i did that i have like a few games that are business cards and that was because i had a coupon to get business cards printed really cheap so I was like okay let me make something for that so that that's a huge part of it. Or I'll see like a way to fold paper to make a zine and be like, all right, let me try to make something that will, a lot of times I'm like, okay, a lot of my, a lot of stuff, especially earlier stuff is what can I make that fits on one sheet of paper folded, however, or what will only, what can I mail, put in the mail and it'll only cost me one stamp to send. That's a big, that's a big part of, my creative process was all right. I want to. I want to mail this to a bunch of people, but I only want to. I want to mail it as cheap as possible. So if it can fit in an envelope and doesn't weigh over an ounce or whatever, then it's it's one stamp. So that's a big thing. Yeah. And your uh, Patreon level, um, you have got three levels, um, mm -hmm. and, and I think levels two and three are print on occasion or depending yes. on the product. Yeah. Um, every once in a while, I will mail something out to those two top two tiers and um i used to do it every month but at one point i got to where it was too many things too many people to mail things to you every month so it's every few months you know every every two to three months um probably more three months usually i'll try to make something that i print and mail out um which that's when i did the last uh postcard game let's see if i have one anywhere um postcards and um i think dog tooth valley was that dog tooth valley i mailed out to everybody um when that came out but yeah so those top two tiers every once in a while i send mail out that was when i started i started my uh patreon with that and it was called the dungeon junk mail where i would just like write a dungeon every month and mail it out to people and so i try to do it just it, it doesn't come as often as it used to just because it got to be a, too much to put together you know do you find uh, having Patreon and patrons, do you find like that pressure of like, boy, I better produce, like they're, they're paying, I better produce for them? Like, how do you balance that out? Sometimes uh, I usually am able to get something done every month. I don't know if I've had a month with nothing yet. There was, I know there was a month where I did, I did shut it down for a month because I wasn't able to get much done. Um, in this past month, like the whole, it was like the last day of the month that I posted the dungeon I'd been working on that I finally had it finished. But uh, every once in a while, I feel the pressure, but also I, I feel like I've been open and honest on there. I've been like, like when I changed it from like a monthly mailing, I was like, hey, I'm going to mail this when I can, like, like you can like change your tier or unsubscribe, you know, it's, it's fine. Like, unsubscribe if you need to it's not going to hurt my feelings it's uh I, I i have to unsubscribe from patreons every once in a while you know like it's i understand it's hard to um so i i try to be as productive as possible but i'll try to be honest that that i can't always get things done so um i i feel like i'm not telling people they're getting something then then they don't um if i had if I made really strict deadlines for myself, I probably would feel a lot of pressure from it, but it's a, it's also the people who are on there have been really understanding whenever I've had, you know, delays and stuff. So it, it's a good, in general, RPG people are all pretty chill and pretty cool. So it's been pretty good for me. Yeah. It's and, not too much uh, pressure. <laughs> That's good. Um, Haunted Almanac uh, through Games on Avoris, the 200 page anthology of a lot of your content that you've released through Patreon. And that was uh, uh, done, the layout was done by Gantijo, uh, from who's from Brazil, and he's got his own um, games that he's done, like Blurred Lines, yeah. does a lot of graphic design in the, yeah. in the industry. Question for you How come you didn't take that on? Like, what was <laughs> the decision making process there? Um, it just would have been a lot of work and kind of one of the things that really made me want to do it was, um, was that games omnivorous was like, 
like, Hey, you can, you send us all the files. We'll, we'll lay it out for you. Like you don't have basically like, I didn't have to do extra work for it besides, you know, finding all my files that were all over the place. But, uh, that, I mean, it was just, yeah, we print, get all the stuff printed and I don't really have to do it. And then they told me that, uh, Contillo was going to do it. And I was like, Oh, even better. He's, that he's one of the best graphic designers, you know, working in the industry. So that was, yeah, I definitely, he, he, he did a better job than I would have done, I think. So, uh, so I was definitely happy with that. Um, and then it's well, funny story is I, I think exalted funeral had a sale on not too long ago, maybe three or four weeks ago. And I've had my eye on the haunted almanac for a while. And I kept, and then that was on sale and I was like, I'm getting it. It was in my cart. And then I went to buy it. And it, by that time, somebody had else snapped up the last one and it was like out of stock. And so, uh, <laughs> so it's still out of stock, but I saw on Games on Divorce that they're reprinting second run. Yes, there's going to be another run of it. Yeah. I don't know when, uh, but, but yeah, they are going to print some more of it. So that's cool. I'm excited about that. Yeah. I've had that same experience of like, all right, this book is on sale. Click checkout and it's gone. <laughs> yeah that's happened to me multiple times on exalted you know oh it's going to be a collector first the first round will be a collector's edition i'll have to call <laughs> for a second round um and then just a question about kind of your whole your setup through itch and drive through and that mm-hmm. kind of like what's the like kind of long tail of your games do you see without prying too much we don't need to know yeah. the financials but the long tail of it as far as like games that you designed like two years ago are they still selling regularly like how does that kind of work for you uh yes i do still sell think there's some things that that don't sell um but kind of a few things that seem to always every once in a while i'll get a sell on um i mean tunnel goons is free but i'll get someone will buy it and do a donation all, all the time i feel like this week i had like a few sales of tunnel goons for like five dollars which is cool because it's free and like that keeps going there's um there's a few others some adventures um at this point in the light of the ghost star that's been in a few of like the big fundraiser bundles so most people have that um but yeah stuff i feel like uh most things have a pretty long tail um i i have a few things that are uh tile sets for maps like hex map tiles for uh hex kit is a software for making hex maps and i've made a few different tile packs for that those are probably my best selling things um which i think really fits into how rpgs work people are more people want tools more than anything and i think which i think a good adventure a good a good book is a tool their best when you know it's a tool that someone can use for their own creativity so um, i definitely feel like there's a parallel with kind of the uh the art assets being my top sellers because that's something you can use to make your own thing um but yeah i feel like things have a pretty good uh shelf life things keep selling um on itch i don't get many sales on drive through that used to be the the uh main place i sold things but I focused more on itch and itch just, you know, became much bigger for me. And then I kind of neglected <laughs> drive through like a lot of stuff I haven't even put on drive through because it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a hassle. It's not too bad, but it's a little more of a hassle to set up a product on there than on itch. It's just really easy. Um, so yeah, itch is my main spot for selling, you know, the digital versions of games. And uh, yeah, if I put something out, I feel like it, most things, will sell for a while and some things will kind of disappear and then somebody will find it and post about it and then it'll get a few sales. So like things will kind of go away and come back. Yeah. And with itch too, I mean, you know, just, you were talking about how much easier it is. One of the things that I appreciate about itch and I can see that you really lean into it is just the layout of the page, the mm-hmm. game page itself. Like you can put yeah. your artistic spin on it. Yeah. Yeah, you can brand the page to you can make it fit the game. You can, you know, add a background and images. Drive through it's it's really hard to even put images on drive through. Like they have to be hosted in the right spot or something. Like you can't just put stuff from anywhere on the internet. <laughs> Um, and I guess uh, the other thing I wanted to talk to you today about, and you posted a little bit on Twitter, is Mid Journey which is for those that don't know, an AI um, driven art 
program where you put in some inspiration mm -hmm. for the AI to take on and create images based upon that. And I, I saw you posting on it. What was your kind of experience with it and what's your take on it? Yeah, so it, it was really fun to play with. Um, yeah, you just type in some words and it will make you some artwork based on your prompt. And you have to, and so you, you put in something and then it gives you some artwork. It gives you four pieces of artwork and then you can say, give me four more, or you can pick one of those four and say, uh, add more detail to that or make four more based on that. So you kind of have these iterations you go through and <clears throat> to get something that I liked, I kind of had to go through it. You have to go through a lot of iterations. It takes some time of being like, of, you know, work more on this, go more. Kind of, it takes you, it takes a little while, but I did get a lot of stuff I liked. Um, you can't get too specific. If you have something real specific in mind, it's not going to work. It's more of a thing where you, you it's more of a, a way to get ideas. I think you could get, you, they'll give you some cool stuff and you'd be like, okay, that's a cool idea. I can work with this. And so, so in that way, it's kind of leading you instead of you leading it in some, some cases. Um, and most of it, most of the artwork, you could tell it's, if you look closely, you can tell it's like done by AI. There's these weird little, you know, graphic articles in it that you can tell. And, um, but some of it, there was some of it that I was like, I really liked. I'm like, oh, this is like, you could use this in a book and it would look fine. Um, it takes out, there's some stuff that you don't get doing art that way. That, that So like, as an artist, I'm not, I was like messed with that. I was like, all right, I'm not worried about this taking my job or anything. Because it, cause it doesn't, it, like you don't have enough control. And also you don't get the, you don't get to go through the process of figuring out what you're doing that you get when you make artwork like when an artist makes artwork a big part of it is you're working through your thoughts and like I've, I've written some I've written stuff and then like okay I wrote this let me try to draw this and then as I draw it like drawing makes you think a different way so you it comes out different than what you thought it was and then you go and update what you wrote you're like okay so it's, it's like a whole nother thinking process that gives you different ideas and if and you don't get that with AI so to me, that's one of the big things is where a human, the way a human makes art, you're going to, is, is a way to expand your ideas. Um, but you can get some cool stuff, especially uh, Gontillo specifically was doing some cool stuff that I saw him do where he was getting, he had figured out some specific prompts to get little artwork that he could cut up and then collage together into really cool stuff. So it's like a cool, I can see AI being a cool tool for creating assets that then you can use for other stuff and also i got some things i was like wow this doesn't really work but this composition is actually really cool because i guess it's drawing from a bunch of other artwork to make it so it's like oh i got i just got four cool composition ideas so then i can go make an artwork and that'll inform it um so it it also was not for me it wasn't cost effective um, like I subscribed to it, it was like $10 a month and you get like 200 images, which is not enough to do for me. It was not enough. Like I went through, I think I, I think it took me two days to use it all up. And I was like, well, I can't, I'm not going to pay more for this. So um, it was fun. Um, I think it could be a tool for some people um, the way that like public domain art is, but um it's not quite there in terms of being, you know, it's not, it's nothing. I don't think it's anything artists need to work, worry about. And if it, I kind of, I, I don't know if this is fair to say yet, but I kind of had, I kind one of my first reactions to it and of people, some people complaining about it also is I was like, if this, if this is, uh, if you view this as something that is able to replace what our, what an artist does or like what you pay if what you pay me to do this replaces it for you then you obviously do not value what I was doing correctly because I, I, I'm like well that I feel like if, if that replaces what you're doing then you were misusing artists anyways like you weren't getting you were using artists to their full potential if this random AI thing is doing giving you what you need it's like 
I'm almost like, well, fine. If that, if that covers your needs, use it. Cause you just need some random images. You don't really need, you don't need, I feel like an artist can elevate things in a way that the AI won't, but I do think you could get a lot of cool images from AI and then build a project around it. Maybe. Um, so I don't know. It's, we'll see. I think there also will, I don't know, but I can see there being a lot of lawsuits in the future related to it just because of the way AI, my understanding is that AI is feeding, learning off of a huge database. I don't know if mid journey is like feeding off of the internet or whatever, but, but the AI is training on artwork. So, I mean, if, if an AI trains on my artwork and then somebody gets artwork from it and that, and the, AI, and the AI software developer is making money off of that. I'm like, to me, that makes sense that the artist should be getting paid too if, if the AI is being trained on their artwork. Um, but it's it seems like it's probably a gray area legally right now. And I, I, I imagine if there's not already, there will be lawsuits in the future and we'll see what what happens with copyright law and all that. But yeah, uh, but yeah so, it's, so, so I do think there's maybe some ethical gray area there. Um, but also, it to me, it's it doesn't do what an artist does yet, so I'm not too worried about it in in that regard. Yeah, and especially in your case where you're like the triple threat, where you uh, do the art, you do the layout <laughs> and the writing, and you make it cohesive. And you can't do that with you know yeah. even even people just doing one of those things. You can't just take the art yeah. and plunk it on or graphic design, same thing. Mm -hmm. Like you make it work together. Yeah, and my latest adventure that's on Patreon right now, I think it's on Itch too. Um, it's called in, in God's Green Earth. All the art in it is AI art when, that I got when I was playing around with it. And I used all there. And it works, but I'm not like, I'm not completely satisfied with it. And I want to eventually go through and do my own art. Because I'm like, oh, these are cool images, but it's not cohesive. It doesn't all fit together. It works, but if I spend the time to do the art, it'll be better. So, so I, I, I was like, I, I know I felt like I experimented with it, had some fun with it, but it's, it's not there for me, at least. I, I, I would rather, you know, do my own art when I, but I could see if you don't have time, if you don't have the time to do that, you know, it, I'm, I'm also, there's a part of me that's like, you know, if, if someone has a cool idea for a little book or adventure and that and grabbing some AI art is going to help them make it, I would rather them make that than, you know, be upset that they didn't hire me to <laughs> do art or something. I don't know. Uh, if it helps people make cool stuff, great. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, it's at, at best it is second tier public domain right now. Yeah. And I think there's even some like small print about that they retain maybe even ownership of the, oh, the yeah. right. And I, I just, I kind of dabbled yeah. with it, but I, yeah. I didn't go as far as you did. I think I had like 10 before I, um, I ran yeah. out and I was just like, well, I'm at eight and I'm, I'll save the last two for another day. Mm -hmm. But uh, before we leave, I know we're kind of running late on or at the end of our time together, but uh, do you have any advice for kind of game designers that are thinking or people that are thinking about getting into game design? Like mm -hmm. what would you suggest to them? Um. I think uh, try to play as much as possible. It's easy to get, it's hard to um, schedule games with people. Like that's a, it's like a cliche of the hobby that, that one of the biggest jobs of a, of a game master is wrangling everyone to get to the table to play. Um, so try to play as much as you can, because if you get, I've had, months where i've just not been able to play and even though i've been making games and working on stuff and it's like man i wrote adventure the less you play the harder it is to make stuff and when you play it kind of refreshes you in a way that you feel that helps you create stuff um there's a i mean it's kind of a cliche but you know don't don't worry about what people are saying is cool worry about what you think is cool what what you want to use my best successes have been things where my focus was making what i wanted to have at the table like like making a book that this is what i this is made so that i can use it this is how i need need it to be laid out this is what's this is the info i have to have to run this um 
other people have different info. I'll, I'll, there's a lot of things that I like some of my favorite adventures, even that I've read, I'm like, I like this a lot, but then whenever I've tried to run at the table, it was really difficult because there was info that I didn't have handy. And then there was a lot of info that I didn't care about that was handy. So it would have taken more prep. Like some of my favorite adventures, I have to do a lot of preparation for. So whenever I'm making something, the stuff that I'm happiest with the stuff that I've been like, I'm going to go ahead and make this from the start where it is prepped for me to run. So focus on what you need and what you like, because there's going to be other people who are going to like that too. I think, I think that'll use, maybe not, maybe not for everyone. Maybe, maybe you're a weirdo and no one, no one can, uh, can uh, well, we'll figure out, out, but, but I bet, I, I kind of figure the weirder it is probably the more hardcore fan base it'll have, you know, yeah. there'll be somebody who's like, that is perfect. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, um, that's, that's kind of a cliche, but I think it's important. Um, I think what else I could say, try to pick up as many skills as possible, um, especially if you're trying to make books. Um, I feel like people can, I feel like there's simple layout and simple tools that people can use. I've seen some stuff that was just laid out really simply in Google Docs and, and then printed from there. And they were great. It was great. Like if you keep it simple, it just needs to be easy to read. You know, it doesn't need to, it doesn't need to have crazy art. Some of the best stuff I've, I've read, I feel like doesn't even have art. Um, yeah, you, you can, it's better to, uh, it's better to make something and get it done than, you know, make it perfect and work on it forever and ever. If something, if you've been working on the same book for years, you know, stop and either either finish it or just you know put it away and go make something and give yourself like two weeks like i got two weeks and i'm gonna if it's not good doesn't matter i'm still putting it out there i feel like it, that'll be something that something mediocre that is released is better than something perfect that no one else is ever going to look at so just don't worry about it not being good nothing's perfect no, nobody's making perfect books it's impossible so no media is perfect except for like you know cat videos on the internet other than that there's no perfect media so just put it out there instead of slaving over it and driving yourself crazy well, that's good advice and uh i'm gonna have links to uh your patreon and your website and uh twitter and all those things in the show notes in the video description but uh, before we leave what's next for you what do you got cooking do you got new kickstarters coming or anything like that um right now it's I'm, I'm going to close it soon, but you can still get in on pre-order. I have a book coming out called Pilgrims of Misfortune. That's, you know, little rules like kind of OSR type game. Um, I'm working on that. Um, that'll, that the plan is to get that printed before the end of this month. There's still, there's still some things I need to write for it that I'm working on. Um, but that you could probably still get in on the pre-order of that. And I'm doing a reprint of in the light of a ghost star um you can pre-order that also and uh i've got i don't have any solid plans for like um a kickstarter or anything um but i have i have a new edition i'm working slowly working on a new edition of in the light of a ghost star where i'm gonna it's gonna be a bit different um and that's probably going to be crowdfunded. And I don't know if it's going to be Kickstarter or back, backer kit now that they've, they've launched their own crowdfunding. Um, but I think I'm going to crowdfund that depends what I, it depends what I end up wanting to do with it. Cause there's some things that if I can just do pre-orders and pay for it and there's not, there's not that crazy, but, but it, it depends on, you know, what, what I'm trying to do and what the costs are, but that'll probably be a crowdfunded thing eventually. But yeah, right now I would say go to highlandparanormalsociety.com and go to the pre-orders page and you can get my new upcoming stuff there and uh, get in probably before, I don't know when this video will be out, but um, before the end of this month is when I'll be, I'll be getting that printed. So, so that'll be a, that'll be, that's a pretty time sensitive one, but uh, if you miss it, I'm going to try to print a few extras and they'll be for sale at different places. So. Well, that's great. And uh, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for joining me today and sharing some of your wisdom with uh, a lot of other designers out there that are eager to learn. So uh, 
you know, thanks again and uh, really great work. Uh, happy to um, showcase it as best I can. And uh, but it's just incredible stuff. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. And, and thanks for being patient with me. It's hard to schedule stuff with me. My life is a little crazy sometimes. So I appreciate you uh, reaching out to me and and, uh, and and letting me give you eventually get back to you uh, with the time that works for me. I appreciate it. So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs>